everybody. My name is Laura Chamblin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanH, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. Welcome to CanH Conversations, Champions for Change. Today we get a, to sit down and spend a bit of time with my dear friend Gregor Snedden. Gregor is the Executive Director of Help H Canada, an organization that's a very near and dear partner to CanH. Gregor, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, it's a real pleasure, Laura. Thanks for the invitation. So let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? What does your family look like? Tell us about your early years. Well, I was born in Vancouver, BC, uh, in, and uh, we, we moved out back out to Ottawa where I really, where I really grew up. Um, this has really been my home out in the, the West End for, uh, for most of my life. Um, you know, I grew up here, was a, you know, played hockey, uh, uh, pretty regular kid, I guess, in most respects. Uh, got into music, was a musician for many years, and that, that got me traveling. And uh, as you know, uh, we, we likely ran into each other down in New Orleans back in the day where I, where I lived for several years and, and played with, with a, few, uh, a few groups. Uh, we, we toured all over the world. Uh, actually, that was, a, that was quite a chapter. Um, and then, you know, really my, my, the real thread of my life is my early life and today was, was really spiritual seeking and I, and I uh, went off and ended up moving back to British Columbia and I lived up in, in British Columbia, uh, sorry, in Vernon, BC, uh, where I lived and worked with a, with a, with a community there. Uh, and I uh, did a, a degree in business administration at, uh, at which is now, uh, UBC up there in the Okanagan, and I ran a, uh, a, a painting company, College Pro Painters. I often say everything I ever needed to learn, I learned at College Pro Painters, and I was an entrepreneur, had a little cafe. Uh, where do you want me to stop? I could just yeah, keep no, going here. With let's the, dig with... into that. So let's let's talk about you know the family, the Sten family growing up. So okay. any siblings? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I have a, a sister. And uh, uh, yeah, I have a sister. And where are you in the chain? Are you older, younger? What is that? Uh, I'm older. Yeah, I'm the big brother, and we uh, we uh, we still get together uh, quite often. Our, our we have kids now, uh, both of us similar ages, and we enjoy spending time together, and <laughs> we feel very blessed. And what did your parents do? What was home like with you growing up? Well, my dad uh, was worked with the government. He was in uh, Indian and Northern Affairs, and my mom was a uh, was a, a, a medical secretary, and 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 uh, we grew up a pretty pretty you know stable lifestyle, uh, you know, in kind of the suburban Ottawa, just on the outskirts. So I grew up working on farms and had a paper route, and uh, you know, pretty much did the regular kid thing, although. The one thing that I guess I did was is is I became an actor as a young person. I ended up getting into a TV series called High School Confidential when I was, uh, you know, I guess 14 years old or so. And so my high school years was I was on these uh, a couple of few seasons of a television series, which got me into ACTRA and uh, which is the Actors Actors Union. And I did a few different things. I even did an episode in. Uh, Oh, what was that, that show with David Duchovny and uh, Jillian? The X Files. You were in the, the X Files. I'm on the. I, I, it's called a Christmas uh, story. In fact, I'm an FBI courier. So uh, that was something unique in my high school years, and also music. I really got into music. Okay, I'm going to start with the growing up on a TV show. Because essentially, you would have spent a bunch of your high school. You know, one part of your life would be in actual high school, the other part of your life would be playing somebody who was going to high school. What was that like? Did you get any insights? Is it really like a John Hughes movie? Like, tell me all about High School Confidential. Well, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. I don't, I don't really know how, you know, I'm kind of a self-reflective person. And sometimes I really wonder, with your, you know, your whole forming sense of yourself, your identity, your, your who you are in relationship to things. You know, often we say that our identity, who we are, is is a totality of all of our relationships. So to suddenly kind of be thrust into this, 
you know, very much being the center of attention and being a Leo, you know, I like to be the center of attention. Don't get me wrong, but to, to, to in such a, a way and, and to be making some, you know, some money at that age and so on. Um, I often wonder if it was, if it's good for the growing self to have that intensity of, of attention. Who was your character? I'm dying to know. Who did My you name was Tom Killer Kilroy, and I was a little mod guy. You know, I, I because I happened to have been into being a mod when I was 14. I don't know if you remember that, the mods and the rockers. Well, hats. So yes, a little little parka and the zoot suits and yeah. uh, the great movie uh, by the Who, Quadrophenia, that sort of tells that story a little bit. So I kind of thought of myself as a pretty cool mod, you know, and. Uh, used to get all dressed up and uh and I was also I was playing music at the time too and so that phase kind of I grew out of that phase and grew my hair all long and kind of became a bit of a guitar sling and hippie you know so I I I I kind of a funny uh funny kid I guess let's follow the line of music there for a second so you music has obviously threaded through your entire life you were a professional musician at one point do you remember picking up your first instrument? Do you remember a moment where you thought, oh, this is part of my life? Or was it always just- Oh yeah, oh no, it, it was, it, it's all about Elvis. It was all about Elvis. When I was uh, five or six years old, we, we did a family trip out to BC and there, the car we rented had an eight track player in it. And, and the, there was a couple of, you know, eight tracks, uh, uh, you know, rolling around on the floor that we and they were Elvis and I just got hooked and I sang them songs all wrong but I started when I got home I like would slick my hair back with water and I'd really kind of fine hairs so that looked really kind of silly and I wear rubber boots I put my my pants in the boots and I try to think of myself as a bit of an Elvis and I went and my mom tells the story that she was one time looking in the newspaper and she zoned in and saw her phone number there you know I think it was 225 whatever the number was and she looks closer and sure enough it says guitar wanted pretty good condition <laughs> and i had called out the penny saver and like put an ad in the paper because i wanted the guitar i guess i'd been saving up my allowance so i had my first guitar and it was all about the pose you know and the lip and sort of being you know the rock star so it started with elvis and then the beatles and uh, and then you know electric guitar, but I pretty much right away by the time, many years later, like at the tender age of 14, it all became about blues music, the blues. And I just got mesmerized by the deep soul and heart of blues music. And in fact, I, um, I guess I, it's okay to confess this now, but I ended up managing to find some fake ID and I would sneak into the local Ottawa blues clubs um, and uh, I'm sure they all must have known, I don't know. But at any rate, I'd, I'd sit there and i watched watch these bands. At this time, bands were coming up all the time from Chicago and New Orleans and New York and uh, A.C. Reed and the Spark Plugs, Albert Collins and the Icebreakers, the Kinsey Report, nonstop. And I just was mesmerized. And I'd sit there in these clubs, um, take the bus downtown, and just, there was nothing, I didn't even hang out anymore too much with what was going on in high school. I just was locked into the blues and I just loved right there. it. Well, there's no, no torment like teenage torment too. So you've got lots to draw on. At some point you ended up, you know, being in New Orleans, right? At some point you ended up, tell me your story about your time in New Orleans. Well, I ended up, you know, I ended up deciding I was going to be a blues man and, uh, so I got in a, a train and I basically went to Chicago, went to uh, Memphis. And that's a whole ep epic story in itself, I suppose. I, I picked up a guitar along the way and ended up in New Orleans with about five bucks, 20 bucks left in my sock. And I got a, I got a, uh, a little job somehow or other. I think I was slinging dishes at a little restaurant called Petunia's in uh, the French Quarter. And... Uh, ended up on the doorstep of my uh my friend johnny sansone um and we i ended up kind of camping out at his place because his uh his, his partner at the time uh, uh was from ottawa and, and uh he kind of let me uh, you know we, we he kind of let me sit in with him once at a blues jam and then he 
we got it started getting a regular he let he hired me to play with him on bourbon street at the old absinthe house and before you know it we were playing you know uh five nights a week down there you'd make twelve dollars and fifty cents a set and all the cheap bud light you could drink and um and we would just play and play, and then we start. And then I started, uh, you know, we went started going on the road and, and driving all over the U.S. and um, and then I got to play in Europe for a few tours with another musician, Andy J. Forrest. And I also began playing gypsy jazz, Django Reinhardt style uh, gypsy jazz with another guy down there named Tony Green. And I did that. I lived down there for about four years. And in fact, I believe it's 1991 or 1992. We won the best blues band in Louisiana award. So that was pretty cool. The dream that, uh, of every suburban Canadian boy from Ottawa. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was the, uh, I can't remember what the, what's the award? What's the magazine down there called? Oh, I can't remember it right now. But uh, <laughs> well, I think you and I figured out that in, I think it was 95, I was down in Jazz Fest in New Orleans and up and down on Bourbon Street. And over the course of communications, I know that I bought tickets and I heard you guys play long, long, long before you got into the field of aging, or for that matter, long before I did as well. So, you know, these points of intersection meet. Let's take a little bit of a further point. You, you went from, you know, being in the altar of arts because you were obviously very involved from a young age in acting and drama and music. And at some point that self-reflection and that engagement took you into the priesthood. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny that you would make that connection. You'd call it the altar of the arts. And I sometimes had reflected, you know, about the experience of, of um, you know, playing blues music or jazz or any kind of real communal kind of music in a sweaty after hours club in like, you know, Arkansas or something like that. You know, you're, you're, you have this incredible sense of, uh, of uh, communion with the musicians you're playing with, with the people around you, the, the audience. I remember uh, one, some, someone making the comment once, you know, you, you get to know your bandmates so well, you, you know when the, when the guy's gonna spit, you know? You may not have anything in common, but you get to know each other so deeply. And there's, there's a profound connection that happens when you're making music together, especially improvisational styles of music and, and not to mention all of the other uh, things that are feeding that, that feeling. But it's, very, it's a spiritual experience. That, that is, that is, a, that is although some people might judge it uh, in a certain uh, way, it's a spirit, profound spiritual experience and, and of, of, of real communion, an experience of spirit. And that really became the, um, the real focus or the, the draw for me as I went deeper and deeper into that music and into my own seeking, because I was always, since a kid, a real seeking kind of kid and I began to look beyond um, the nightclub and beyond playing music and and also the the toll that was having on me I guess as I was uh, as I was you know growing up a little bit still haven't quite grown up yet but on the way of growing up and I, I began asking and asking deeper questions and trying to understand uh, those those bigger questions, you know, of uh, who am I and uh, what is what is God, you know, and kind of discovering they're both kind of the same question in the end, or they both lead you to the same place. And I began seeking in in all kinds of the East, uh, very drawn to the East. Uh, one of my little uh, forays along this journey was I, with some of my money that I'd made from acting, actually, I spent it all was a trip to Europe and the Middle East. And when I was in the Middle East, this was in 1989 uh, during the second intifada in, in, uh, in uh, Palestine, Israel, I, I was stuck in the West Bank for several months. And I discovered uh, Sufism. I discovered the, uh, the, the rich- yeah, The mystical deep, form of Islam. Yeah, the mystical path of Islam and all the great saints, Hafiz and, and Rumi and, and that really uh, became a, uh, a path for me for many years. And that's what ended up drawing me to British Columbia uh, to be with an elder there by the name of Marat Yagan, who was a Circassian and Abkhazian uh, elder. 
uh, and a community there uh, to really go deeper into those questions and, and to um, uh, go deeper. Yeah, that, that so, thing of going deeper is a really important one. Am I right in thinking that there was a time in your life that you were working with, uh, you worked with vulnerable populations a lot in your life, which I think is going to take us into our conversation about aging. But I think sort of after that point and before where you've landed now at Canage, you work with some other vulnerable populations in community as well. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Well, I, I uh, just to say that I, um, you know, after my time there in British Columbia and uh, uh, I ended up working in, a, in, in, in some philanthropy with a, a community in rural West Virginia. It was kind of a, through these connections I made in BC and with our community there, um, with some very good friends of mine who, were, who did very well in the um, cellular phone uh, business. And they had a family foundation and I went down there to sort of assist in reaching out to rural populations in rural West Virginia to sort of identify organizations that could use support and help that align with their family's values and so on. So that was a really neat experience. Uh, remember the High Rock School for Girls um, and there were some others that, you know, you I really discovered the nature and idea of organizations or people that, 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 that frame their life around helping the other. You know, in many ways in my own, from my own experience, uh, spiritual seeking has been a very much a uh, self-obsessed journey of, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, whether it's self-glorification or self-emancipation, sometimes you just don't quite know. But, you know, you, you, I, I suddenly discovered this this people who uh, empty themselves for other people. You know, they, they, they make great sacrifice to help the other. And that was tremendously moving for me to experience that. And these weren't particularly religious people. Uh, they were just people that made choices that they could do no other than to sacrifice themselves for the other. And that really pivoted my 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 own spiritual seeking um, and that's when I began um, really digging into uh, theology I um, I began to study theology I, I went and I lived in uh, uh, the monastic community for uh, several years and, and began discerning and really seeking that out and uh, ended up um, you know in my in my explorations in, in Sufism you know, I, I discovered some amazing truths and some amazing things about, about life and about myself, but I was able to then, for the first time, see them in my own cultural tradition of being a Christian. And suddenly my own Christian uh, language and story was now animated and full of, a, of, a, of deeper truths. They now pointed to something greater. And that's really what drew me into uh, theology and uh, I ended up doing uh, several, you know, uh, some degrees in theology, pastoral theology. I was ordained as a, as a priest in the Anglican Church of Canada and then I continued my studies in Eastern Christian studies uh, in, in the Orthodox tradition. And, and through that time um, I started out uh, being a chaplain in a, in a homeless center, Center 454 with the Ottawa Anglican Community Ministries. And that was an amazing experience of, of discovery of being with people. And most of all, Laura, it was the, the greatest discovery was really about myself because you know, you're know you there in a homeless center with, with folks that you know, really are just a hair away from death. Yeah. And yet, and yet these people were the ones in the end that were really feeding and serving me. You know, I was there to help and serve them, but you just realize that, you know, th that person on the street is really just a cigarette paper away from, from me because 
at the very heart, I realized, you know, I'll, I'll give you the story. I, you know, you're in a room full of people, if you can imagine homeless people, quote, quote, homeless people and playing cards and hanging around and so on. And these are people that often have a very difficult time fitting in. They are on the margins, they're excluded, and we're there to try to help them. But I, I observed in myself as I was in this room of people sitting on the corners, how great my desire was to be accepted by them. I, I, I suddenly saw how vulnerable and naked I was. And, and I realized that at the core of my being is the need to be loved and to belong. And I realized, I looked around and realized that's what everyone's need is. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but that is at the heart of, of so many of our challenges and problems with this, with this world of ours is our ability to know we're loved and to love one another, to accept one another, to accept oneself. Um, you know, there's a great saying, I can't remember who says it, but uh, he says, you know, this is the problem that, this is the, the narrative that so many of us have. If you really knew me, you probably wouldn't like me. And I think we wear that so deeply. So many of us wear that language. And Mother Teresa says, you know, the, the, the greatest poverty is the feeling of being unloved or unwanted. Absolutely. And that is such an interesting point to pivot into how we became connected, which is around the field of aging. So you've come on this journey, this personal journey, you've been engaged in self-reflection and energy exchange, I think is a big piece of what you're talking about, whether energy in community or energy in in small groups and and self-reflection, you've got these pieces that are together. You have this, and I guess I'll use the term epiphany with some caution, but you have a bit of this clarity around the the notion of love and vulnerability and, and that, thin connection that separates people to often when they're at their most fragile, socially fragile. You joined Help Age Canada very recently. It's been almost a year. Or just no, it's a been a year yesterday. A year yesterday. A year yesterday. And tell us a little bit about, you know, your thoughts around aging and your thoughts around this position and what it's meant for you in this last year. You know, it's just been an extraordinary year. You know, when I look back to a year ago yesterday, you know, starting this new role uh, with Help Age Canada, we, um, who could have known what lay ahead a year ago today? You know, uh, there was rumblings of this COVID business in the background uh, happening, but, you know, no one really thought anything of it more, at least I didn't think anything more than just a, you know, a little one of those, another bird flew passing through, uh, and here we are in a new world today. Um, you know, I in my in my in my uh, twelve years or so in in parish ministry, where I was operating parishes and so on. You know, you you come to know older people very well, as you know, uh, a large, significant population of uh, Sunday attendees are are senior folks and. I had the, uh, you know, one of the great privileges of that life is the tremendous intimacy you get to spend with people uh, at their most profound, significant points of life, birth and uh, death um, and so on. And I had the privilege of visiting and meeting with older people over and over and over and uh, journeying with them as they passed on to their, uh, to uh, the next, uh, the next leg of the journey, so to speak. And uh, again, it was it was building that awareness of the great dignity of of human life, um, and the 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 value of being a person. What a, what a person is someone a self reflective human being with feelings and um, and stories and memory and relationships and and um, that awareness that we as a culture value some people more than we value others. I mean, uh, and I, uh, myself included, I, I, it's part of, uh, I, part of our, our narrative 
our our DNA. We we have this these stories that we it's, it's very difficult to get away from. So Help Age Canada was this. Uh, it was a real opportunity to engage with um, trying to shed light and, and bring support and engage with a whole segment of our world population that is so often overlooked uh, and so often suffer. Um, Not everyone may be as familiar uh, as I am with Help Age Canada. So help us know a little bit about the history of the organization and how it connects both in Canada, but also globally, because there's a very strong Help Age global connection. So tell us a little bit about the organization or maybe, sure. um, and then maybe we'll dug in a little bit more to some of the work that you're doing right now. Sure, sounds good. Well, Help Age Canada has been around since 1975 um, and it started very organically. I, I believe it, it, well, it was, uh, became a, a registered charity in 1984 and has been active in Canada and around the world uh, ever since that time. It, it really focuses on low income older people, uh, addressing isolation and loneliness or marginalized and vulnerable seniors. We were partners with CEDA for, for many, many years doing humanitarian work uh, all over the world. And uh, we have a, and we continue to have a sponsor grandparent program right now where we operate that program in six countries in India, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Dominica, Haiti, um, and uh, Jamaica, did I say Jamaica? No, nope. six, six countries. Uh, uh, that's been an, an ongoing, you know, wonderful relational program. Um, it's it's can be a very difficult, uh, and, and it's very um, intensive operating it. But we match a, an overseas older person with a with a Canadian, uh, and they have the opportunity to build a, a relationship. And funnily enough, my my wife, who works in long term care. Uh, works in a dementia unit, and she was recently with you know one of the one of the people that that she works with there is very far along in dementia, uh, barely able to even certainly know her own name even. But her last possession that she won't let go of is her sponsored grandparent in India, but it has her picture beside her bed. So this lady, bless her heart, you know her little pension once a month goes to this donation and. And it's cultivated this wonderful bond, but I digress. So we, we and now we continue to work with Global Affairs Canada. Um, we, we're projects in Ethiopia at the moment. We've, we've done our own work in Eastern Ukraine um, and we continue to uh, look, look for opportunities to engage, especially in humanitarian response for older people all through the Global South where uh, older people are particularly vulnerable. In Canada, we've run a number of different programs. One of the recent ones was called the RISE campaign, Reach Isolated Seniors Everywhere. Um, but now we have moved and we're, we're doing a, uh, a few programs. One's called Seniors Can. We provide uh, grants uh, addressing isolation and loneliness for uh, mobility and communications devices or creative or innovative programming for agencies that deliver programs that address isolation and loneliness. We have our COVID-19 response. We, we uh, raised over $600,000 and uh, dispersed humanitarian relief across the country through over 70 agencies across the country, as well as uh, addressing social isolation. And that emerged into the Seniors Can Connect program, which is about digital literacy, uh, and providing devices to people that may, uh, like tablets, that may not, uh, that may not have access to them. Um, and we're we're exploring opportunities to support older people in Nunavut, as some other First Nations communities, as well as exploring how to engage uh, and expand that digital literacy program uh, throughout Canada. So you've been there for a year and a day. And yes, a year and a day. And. Of that time, the majority has been in the time of COVID-19. Yeah. How has that shifted your thinking and your organization's thinking about kind of the importance 
of where seniors programming needs to go in the next couple of years. What's changed for you and for your organization because of COVID? Well, I mean, gosh, COVID-19 has really changed everything. I mean, for one thing, it's really brought the, the spotlight onto the needs of seniors as, as you have been uh, leading us, uh, leading the country in, in, in revealing so much of, of uh, what, is, what has been happening. But uh, so there's that, there's the raising awareness of those needs. There's also the, the highlighting isolation and loneliness. So how, do we, how do we help uh, provide especially marginalized seniors to give them voice to keep them connected, whether that's through digital uh, literacy and other means to keep older people connected. Uh, it's addressing policy frameworks and and being able, like the Voices document that CanAge has uh, has put together, that addresses so many of the needs of Canadian older older people across Canada. I think really lays out a great roadmap for us to address. I mean, are we going to hit every one of those items over the next two years? Well, probably not. But it gives us uh, it gives us something for everyone to bite their teeth into uh, to move forward with whatever their particular gifts are. Transportation, for example, uh, is a huge issue, as we know, across Canada for older people. Um, uh, so these are all areas that we need to be looking at. But I think one of the, the things for me as well is that, you know, it's not like uh, there was somehow some nasty group of people that were trying to uh, hide seniors in long-term care homes or the government somehow had some policy to turn a blind eye. You know, I, I think that what is being revealed is the fruit of, of what we've all participated in. We're all equally responsible for the conditions and some of the terrible conditions in care homes across this country. It's not, we can't point the finger at anyone because we make choices, we elect officials, we vote on policy, and we vote on where what's important to us. And we are in the midst of a cultural shift of where people are, um, uh, uh, we're changing as a whole civilization, individualism, um, the way that we spend time together, the way that people don't join things anymore, the way that we are moving closer and closer into uh, spending time looking at our tablets. I remember a friend of mine recently, a close friend of mine who I won't name, uh, was, you know, watching a movie in bed and, and, uh, and you know, as, as many of us do with their laptop, and she was having a glass of wine and she said, well, at least I'm sitting up. You know, we're, 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 we're changing as a culture. <laughs> you know? We're, we're... You know, that may become the motto of COVID-19, at least I'm sitting up. Like, that is actually a point. Yeah. I just want to kind of, you know, end our conversation with a bit of forward thinking. I mean, you have had an incredibly interesting and inspiring and diverse roadmap of a life, you know, from, uh, you know, theories of arts, journeys that you've had together, internal exploration, as well as external exploration, a real sort of um, steward and servant mentality, uh, wrestling with how to best serve populations, whether it be through nourishing people in the arts or nourishing people with food in homeless shelters. So you've been in this position for a year and you have certainly been engaged in issues with aging for a long time. That's not a new idea. You've been working with people in a variety of contexts across the life course. I wanna kind of leave with two questions. And so the first is I want your reflection for what you discovered over this year that surprised you. I mean, you, you've got a long, deep set of paths, but, but in this last year, what has surprised you or what is an insight that you have that you haven't had prior to this year in the field of aging? And the second question I'm gonna follow up with is, so I'll give you ahead of time is, what advice would you have for people who are interested in joining the field of aging? So first of all, this last year, has there been a surprise, an epiphany, a learning that you could share? 
Well, that's that's a really great question. Um, you know, where, wherever you go, there you are. You know, I, is you're always, you know, even though you mentioned these these sort of, you know, when reflecting on my my sort of uh, colorful uh, past, so to speak. But, you know, you're, you're always looking at, in the mirror at the same person and you're always, in a, in a way, always facing the same uh, issues, the same dragons of this and so on. And I guess one of the big things for me in a personal note is, is, is patience and communication and understanding um, how, how big the community in aging is and how you... The amazing people that are in there that many of the friends that you have introduced me to um, that has been just a wonderful experience to know this whole to, to begin to know this great community of people that are uh, that are out there doing this this great work the the the, the patience and um, the investment in trusting relationships you know is a big a big affirmation is it's again all about building those trusting relationships to try and move the can forward a little bit um, uh, with each other as we as we do our best to help older people. So advice um, for people entering the field sounds like there's people. some ad sounds like there's a bit of advice on on relationships and the importance of investing. Yeah, yeah, I would say you know again is is. We, we, we're part of our work, all of our work, whether it's this field or in the work of helping others is, in my view, is just raising the awareness of the value and dignity of the human person, of, of people, you know, uh, these sacred beings that we, and, and all of creation is something that we are stewards of in this work. So people entering the field of aging, I think it's a growing, exciting opportunity, multi-dimensional, uh, and I would encourage anybody to do for it. You're in for a great community of people to work with. I'll tell you that with with a with a very bright future and a very rewarding future, um, because we have a long way to go, but it's all going to be upside from here. I know it. Well, this has been a wonderful chance to hear about how the journey of your life has now been transformed into service for our future. And I know that I join all Canadians in thanking you for your leadership, your stewardship, your commitment. You could be spending it in a lot of different areas and I'm really glad that you're spending it you know, in our field of aging. Gregor, thank you so much for spending time talking to CanAge Conversations, Champions for Change today. Thanks, Laura. Real privilege. And I, I'm just grateful to you and to CanAge and wish you all the best, you and your team. Happy holidays to you and your family. Happy holidays to you too.